probably typed it. Maybe his wife typed it. One guy had a typewriter. I'm sorry. You know what? What? Let me change the tape. Ah. Um, you said that, just tell me a little bit again, that the, 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 the men who wrote this letter were the precursor to the black local union. They were the precursor to the NAACP or something so that we understand a little bit who they were. You know, they were a loose group. They didn't have an affiliation, but, you know, they were doing civil rights. That's what they were doing. And explain about the typewriter. In time of this letter to about Irving Mills' situation, the 50 employee employers at that time were perhaps involved with a cooperative endeavor to write a letter. I would suppose that Lonnie Peoples, who, along with his sister, had SS or had typewriters of their own. And I would think that Lonnie Peoples, in all probability, was able to type this letter along with words being supplied by some of the other people. They were the forerunners of union workers and activists. They were not in WACP, they were not organized as a group as such, but they did commune and talk with each other about their concerns. And I'm sure that if we had to point to one person who was capable of typing this letter, it would have been Lonnie Peoples, and maybe his sister, Prunus Johnson, might have helped him. But he could type, and she could type. And I'm sure that with the help of other people getting together and composing the words of the letter to Mr. Johnson, were perhaps typed by Lonnie Peoples. Okay. And, um, could you explain to me at, at the time here in Kulame, maybe how many <coughs> black work, how many, you know, the, the relationship between the black workers here, the black workers, what they, the jobs that they did in the mills, and or what the black women did for the mill families. And, uh, I mean, and, and just say, like, the Kulame was, you know, mill town. We had one mill, and that was a business. That's, and just to sort of go on from there. Okay. It, Do you need a drink of water? No, or no. Okay, at, this per at the wait, time that we are talking wait, about. In Can you, like, uh, say in the 1930s? Don't say at the time. Say okay. in the 1930s. Yeah, why don't you wipe off your face? How's your, yeah, what happened in that car accident? You, you... In 1934, when this action was going on, Kulame at that time was a mill town, the only industry here. The workers, especially the colored workers, they worked in primarily the cloth room, the dye house, the dust room and the flat form of the cotton house. They unload the cotton, haul out the trash, did the dust work where the old materials that could not be used were filtered and bailed up to be sent off. They also worked in the in the part that generated heat for the plant. They also worked in what they call the outside, which maintained the houses that the company owned at that time. And the outside department also unloaded the coal that came in in boxcars. They also had a stable at that time where they had horses that delivered and picked up trash in the town. These men took care of the horses and they delivered certain items. At that time, trucks were not really available, not that many trucks available. So the meal depended upon the horses. Now, as far as the colored women, none of them worked in the factory at that time. 
Most of them either wash clothes and iron clothes for the white workers. It was quite a few uh, executives who lived in, at that time, a hotel that was operated by the company. My mother washed and ironed for three of those fellas. We would pick the clothes up on Monday and take them back on Wednesday. Um, other people worked in their homes. Believe it or not, they would work for anywhere from a dollar and a half per week to sometimes two dollars if they were fortunate. The banker had people that worked with him. So the women worked primarily in the people's homes. Some of them worked on the farm. Some of them worked at at, um, at the plant, uh, not the plants, but the workers for the plant. Could you could you elaborate just a little bit on the women's and here? You know, the white women would go to white women could work inside the mills. So who was taking care of their children? So the black women were taking care of their children while the white women were in there, and they'd cook for them. And then they go home, and then they'd have to cook and clean for themselves. Could you do that? Well, the colored women would always work in the homes of the white women who were working in the weave room and the cutting room where the, the white women worked. And they would have black women taking care of their children while they worked. And it was only a small amount of money that they could make even then. And I believe around a dollar and a half a week, sometimes two dollars. They thought they were rich when they started making three dollars a week. But that was the going rate for the colored women in those days is to work in the kitchen, and they didn't have what they called babysitters and all of that in those days. It was the nanny, and and they kept the, the white people's kids. They'd go home and cook. But a lot of times, those those days of cooking, you had an old wood stove, coal stove, and they'd put the beans on before they went to work in the white folks' kitchen, and their beans would be simmering on most of the day, and they'd come home and they'd finish up their dinner. And this was when they just had one shift at the plant. That was before they started having two and three shifts. So people who got off from work early enough, they'd come home and do the garden work and grow their garden. They grow, grew a lot of their food in those days. And there was no freezer. They canned almost everything. Most of them raised hogs or some kind of uh, meat to go along with the vegetables. Now, you were telling me about Roosevelt last time, and you and I said, now, now I was only nine, but we had we were the only people who had a radio. Was that right? And everyone came to our house and... And, yeah, we listened to Roosevelt on the radio, and maybe you could go on from there. Because, see, they wrote this letter after Roosevelt was coming on the radio. Because he came on, what, 33? Okay. Why don't you take a glass drink of water real quick? How long do you... Uh, when Franklin D. Roosevelt... All right, wait. Okay. Well, I'm looking at you. Yes, sir. I can remember when we felt like Franklin Roosevelt was going to lead us out of the dark days. And we had a radio. Many people did not have radios. But other people would come to sit around that one radio and listen to the chats that Franklin Roosevelt would give on the radio. And we were happy to know he came out with several supposed-to-be programs. WPA was one of them. The CC Conservation Act was another one. And we were happy to see something being done. So many people were able to go to work and they had programs that would help people to work instead of having to wonder how they were going to live. Now, the, one, the thing that we're interested in is the NRA. Now, do you as a nine-year-old remember the Blue Eagle? Do you remember, do you remember Happy Days Are Here Again? Do you remember any of that stuff? Or do you just remember seeing... All the black people in your, you know, all the people in your community coming and sit, were they outside your window? Were they in your living room? Where were they? When the weather was nice, you could have them sitting almost everywhere on the porch because most uh, houses in those days had a porch and people would be sitting on the porch because we didn't have many fans, if any. And they would be sitting on the porch and anywhere that they could find a place to sit. And NRA was one of those things that you saw the emblem and 
as far as remembering about it at this point. I don't know all the details, but I do know that we could hear people talking about what it, it was supposed to do. And it was interesting just to be sitting there listening, even though you couldn't remember everything that was being said. Okay, one more time, I want you to say, you know, we had, we were the only, were you the only family who had a radio, or were there one of We, we were one of the, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to talk over this answer with you, and then we're going to let you do it. Were you the only people, or was there one well, of it was probably two or three other people in the whole town, whole black community, community colored community who had radios. You were, did you say you're the only one? No, we were perhaps one of the three people. Okay. Who, so if you could say maybe there were one or two, maybe there were you know, tops, there were three people in the black community who had radios. Okay. And I remember people coming to our house and listening to Roosevelt do his fireside chats. Okay, ready? Okay, I'm ready. I can remember that we were one of the three people or so in the community who had radios at this time, and people would come to visit us and listen to Roosevelt give his fireside chat as the President of the United States. And this was one of the things that seemingly brought people closer to each other. And do you think this is, having listened to the fireside chats, reading the newspaper, is this what propelled these guys to think, okay, Roosevelt's on our side, or, I mean, from what we spoke about last time, it seemed like maybe Roosevelt wasn't something you all believed in, or then, I mean, what? I smile because I believe uh, at this point, a lot of people were disappointed with the administration that was going out. And I don't have to name them, but we were into that in trying to get over the depression, the big fall in 29. And Roosevelt was our gleam of hope with what he called the New Deal. And people said, we got to do better than we have done. And it was the life of hope. A lot of people who had not voted for the party that Roosevelt represented ended up voting for Roosevelt. And that is the point that I think turned some of the cities into a two-party system. At one point, it was just only one party. So, okay. And did, and what did Roosevelt, do you think, what did Roosevelt represent to the colored community? I'm putting that in quotes. I think this was the first time being young enough to understand, this was the first time that we could see a hope that somebody was going to try to do something to make things better for the colored people at that time. It was a ray of hope that we had not envisioned before from other administrations. I could hear people talking about this man has a grip on what is needed to help our country. And could do you, that's great, that's great. And um, is there anything that you might want, I mean, none of these folks are alive who wrote this letter, right? No. Could you, could you say something to the effect about, you know, none of them alive, but what is, did you, and did you know about this letter before I brought it to you? No. Could you say that? Say that. Okay. Uh, the letter of 1934 was written by a group of people, and I had no knowledge of this letter until recently. I was advised that there was a letter, and it's been authenticated that it is real, and it was from Kulumi. And I really believe that the people who wrote this letter, even though they're all deceased now, that they had a major part in this letter being written and forwarded to Washington.
I mean, I basically, um, now you are, you know, something. At this particular time, you're, you're thinking in terms of people who, even though they wanted something to be done about it, they always had to wonder what was their next move without cutting their own throat. So I'm sure that word got around and was filtered down to people. Uh, I was telling my daughter the day about this 1934 letter. She saw it. And I was telling her that your grandfather was a part of this and also that there were people who were coming in prior to a union being formed. You'd be surprised if you had a way of tracking it down. How many outsiders from perhaps as far away as Massachusetts and Connecticut and places like that and that's what was making it a hotbed around here in the South because so many outsiders was coming in as a forerunner to a union. That's what they were afraid of. Who's they? Who are you talking about? The today? officials of the textile industry. They were afraid of a union. Well, they changed the whole thing. Just like people changed the whole thing. They were all... Can you tell her who they were again? Yeah, okay. When you say outsiders, I mean, I know that the local unions were organized by Southerners, not just by outsiders. Judy, you know your research, and I know my la life. Yes. I know people who came here. I know a brother-in-law of my brother who came here from New York to help try to organize people even in, in R.J. Reynolds, right in the 30s and the late or, or early 40s. And this was a movement. And I'm not trying to refute what you research. I'm trying to tell you what I know, too. See, I left home in 44 to go see the Big Apple. But I know also what was going on prior to that. And unions was hard, and there was people who were not anywhere near North Carolina. Sure, the late Harold Carter helped organize the black union because he was one of the whites here in Ptolemy who helped organize the union. But he helped organize the colored worker union also. So, but these guys became paid people and they were called traitors by the people who didn't want a union. And the people I'm talking about were the executives and the people from headquarters for Urban Mills. Urban Mills had a branch plant here in Ptolemy. They were from down about Durham in, in a little town called Irving, North Carolina. And the big stockholders didn't want a union. And when I say they, I'm talking about the executives, the wheels, the people who had, they thought a lot to lose by letting a union in. But by 1939, there was a, there was a union here that was organized and the black workers joined, is that right? And they had their own separate union. Could you say that? By the time a union was able to be organized in Irving Mills, which was around 1939, they had a union form and they had separate unions for the white workers and a separate union for the colored workers. And the colored workers union operated at the old school, Coolman School Building and what was called at that time North Coolman School Building. And they met regular just like the white union met. And occasionally the representative for the union would come to sit in on the colored union meetings. And how long did the union last year in Kulumi? I really don't know how many years it lasted because finally Burlington Mills bought Irving Mill out. And by that time I had migrated to New York and then in service. Last question. Um, we, they wrote this in private. No one until today really knew who wrote this letter. What does it mean to name the names of the people who wrote this letter back in 1934? Wait, one second. Could you um, talk about that? To talk about secrets and history being passed down or not passed down and what it means to name names of people who participated. At this time, in the 34s and upward to the union organization, 
they had that way of having supposedly those social clubs and organizations where they would have bingo parties and that was a social outlet but they discussed their business in private among those people who would come. That's the way they did their work behind the scenes. At one point prior to the formation of the union, they had what they called the Young Men's Social Club of North Cooley. The colored people were only people who belonged to it. They would meet at different houses and they would discuss what was going on in their world of work along with other interests uh, interest in the community. What's it like to name names and add names to this letter 60 years after it was written? I feel like this is the time for people to know and realize that had not these people taken these steps, we probably would not have gained as much as fast as we did. So to name them, I would like to feel like we're giving credit to the people who started an active movement for the colored people. Was it just for colored people, or was it were they part of the labor movement at that time? Were they doing something? For, were they were they joining forces with the white people in a sense? Because it was a period of liberation for everybody. In a in a. At this particular time, when? What time at, are you talking about? In 1934, and up till the time Union was formed, these people had to do their work for themselves. They felt like, sure, this is a labor movement, but this is our movement now, because they felt like they were being left out. And so to actually organize themselves was that way of getting attention for them, even though it ended up being a, a joint effort finally, but at first it was them going for themselves. They had to be a part to let people know our voices need to be heard. So inadvertently, it turned out to be that they had to join forces with the labor movement. It was, became a part of it. But at first, they were actually trying to call attention to the colored workers' needs. And what was it like for you to grow up in a mill village? Could you say, I grew up in Kuwini, it was a mill village. Could you explain that to me just a little bit? It's easy for me to say, growing up in this uh, small mill village, I had very little... Uh, discrimination as such, except knowing that I had to go to a school that sat on one hill for colored people, and other schools sat on another hill for white people. I also know that they had a high school right here in, in Coolamy for the white high school kids, but we either had to go to a school in Moxville, passed by a white school, to get to the black high school. And my daddy sent us to Salisbury, which was 13 miles away. So that was the education part of it. But as far as growing up, we played ball against each other. If we had a fight, it wasn't black-white. It was just two boys decide to fight. Okay, but I want you to talk about growing up in a mill town, in a mill village. Segregation somewhat understood. The control of the mill village. What was the, the presence of the mill? I mean, what did that mean? The people, when, when Irving Mills was blooming, the economy was nice. But I can remember also when they went on three days, two days, and people had to do a lot of shifting to get along. So, yes, growing up, it was, in case, some cases, it was hard. Um, to get along. Segregation, it was there, but it was a written thing, unwritten thing, that you go your way, I go my way. I didn't have a whole lot of uh, white, black, or what have you, arguments. We went to the post office, we got our mail. No mail was delivered at that time. 
My dad was one of the few blacks who had a post office box as long as I can remember at the post office. So, sure, some of the things that some people who were colored endeared, I didn't. Okay. I want you, one last question. I'm starting to have a problem with this little rubber band. Really? Like what? It's kind of like, it sounds like something on a cord. Okay. Oh. Stop, Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Listen, could you describe, your daddy worked in the mill. Just be nine years old and describe to me what the mill village looked like or what, you know, did you go in and work with your daddy? Did you go in and see him working? I just need something mill villagey from you. Basically, when I t think about what we did, with my daddy working and a lot of times working from 8 to 5, we carried his lunch to him. We were not allowed inside the gate, but we carried a lunch right to the gate, and they would come out and get that lunch. And usually mom would fix lunch in what they call a lunch bucket. And it was usually a lard bucket that they had emptied lard out of, three pound bucket or whatever. And that would be his lunch. And to actually get inside the meal, we were not allowed inside the gate, but we could stand out and see them unloading trucks, see them walking backwards and forth across what they call the race. That's where they dumped some of the the brief from the plant. Um, but as far as going into the plant, we didn't. The company owned a company store at that time. So that's where we young people would go buy a cookie or a soda, but hang out there sometime because some of the workers would come up there and eat lunch right near the, what they call the company store. Also in the mill town, it was one drug store and one combination cafe and market, city market, city cafe. And did, did you grow up thinking that you were going to work in the mill? Was that something that it was assumed? Most of us thought that we would end up working there, and for a short period I did, but my daddy had visions. He wanted us to have what he called enough education to get out where we perhaps could make what he called a decent living without having to work so hard for it. So he sent us away to school. I think we did it. Thank, Thank you any, very anything, much. Anything that you feel you left out that needs to be said? I would like to say that this is an opportunity to pay tribute to the people who made progress possible in the town of Coon. Room tone? In tone? Okay. Coolby, North Carolina, March the 9th, 1934. Honorable Hugh Johnson. Dear sir, as an employer of the Urban Cotton Mill Company, Coolby, North Carolina, I feel disposed to inform you of the following. Around 50 colored people work for the above mentioned company. Some on outside work, and some work in the cloth room department, and some in the cotton house, and draw for their labor $9 per week for 40 hours. We are under the impression that we should draw $12 per week under the code, as practically all these men have been working for this company for a long time. It is not our desire to cause any trouble in this matter. But if we are entitled to more wages under the code, then we desire you to have your representative to check up on the above company and see that we get our rights. 
This is an anonymous letter and it's signed by an employee of the Cotton Mill Company, Cooley, North Carolina. What about the X? And it's signed with an X indicating that it is an anonymous letter. No personal signature. It is our desire to cause not to cause any trouble in this matter, but if we are entitled to more wages under the code, then we desire you to have your representative to check up on the above company and see that we get our rights. And this is signed in the usual way in those days with an X denoting it is an anonymous letter. Coolman is considered to be in the Piedmont area of North Carolina. It is bounded on both sides by the Yakin River. It is as close as town of any size is Salisbury, which is approximately 13 miles south of Coolman. Moxville is the town seat okay, in Coolman. Okay, you getting too specific. I just need it like Coolman was a little mill town. And it was all, you know, it was by itself, you know. I'm just something, you don't have to get too specific with all the, just, you know, it was a mill town in the middle of, in the, in, in the, I don't know, maybe there's a no other way to do it either, specifically general, but I don't need every little town, but I just need to know, like, it was a mill town that was shut off by Kumi is a mill town. And it is approximately 13 miles from Salisbury. The only store in Kulam at that time was the company store. Jaden left a company store. To buy clothes and anything that Jaden left or didn't have, Salisbury was the closest town if you needed a pair of shoes, a suit of clothes, or anything in dress wear, people usually ended up in Salisbury. And that was the closest place to do your shopping. All right, so it was a tiny, it was just a mill town. That's all that was, that was the only show in town, right? Okay, and that's like, and the town, that's all. I just need to sort of understand that. At that time, they only had one theater also. They had a theater all right in the same block as the store was. Cooley was a small town with one theater. We're just going to get an over-the-shoulder shot of you holding this letter, and then you pull the weed back. Coolman, North Carolina, March 9, 1934. Honor for Hugh Johnson. Dear sir, as an employer of the Urban Cotton Mill Company, Coolman, North Carolina, I feel disposed to inform you of the following. Around 50 colored people work for the above-mentioned company. Some on outside work, and some work in the cloth room department, and some in the cotton house, and draw for their labor $9 per week for 40 hours. We are under the impression that we should draw $12 per week under the code, as practically all these men have worked for this company for a long time. It is not our desire to cause any trouble in this matter. But if we are entitled to more wages under the code, then we desire you to have your representative to check up on the above company and see that we get our rights. Signed employee of the Urban Cotton Mill Company with an X, Coonerman, North Carolina. Anonymous letter.
And I'm going to have to ad lib this on. Okay, let's see. Okay, you ready? Okay. The way I knew where to start, my dad was eight in 1934. I knew it was after his birthday. And so I started at September 1st since his birthday was the day after. Uh, there's a lot in here about um, the strike starting walkouts. You know what? You don't want to see me. Sometimes I have to stop and move this thing up and down. Just see. Okay. There's an ad in the paper from the merchants congratulating all of them for sticking to their jobs instead of going out on strike. And it's got all the, the merchants that paid for the ad at the bottom of the page.
five within three to four minutes there was six dead and nobody knew who fired the first shot The police say that the firing was off of both sides. Okay. Sheriff W.A. Clamp was in the midst of the short-lived fight. He quotes, I was standing in the middle of the crowd. There were 250 or 300 all told, I guess, he said. Workers and strikers had been arguing for about an hour. We were watching the situation and doing all we could to quiet it. I was holding one of the workers to keep him from getting in at some of the strikers who had come up to stop the mill from running. There were lots of words passed. Suddenly the first bit of fighting I saw was a man knocked down. I think he was an officer. I don't know who hit him. Then the firing started. I don't know who shot who shot first. I don't know all the men out there and there were only a few women. In a minute it seemed everybody was shooting. Bullets kicked up around my feet. They were shooting pistols, rifles, and shotguns. From what I can learn, all the men killed were strikers. Many of the wounded were strikers. Maybe one or two workers were hurt, but we don't we haven't been able to check up. So there were many hurt, only a little bit left after the shooting. The fire, firing lasted just a couple of minutes. There weren't, really wasn't time to do much of anything because it stopped almost as quickly as it started. I was lucky to get out of it alive. People all around and shooting and bullets sang about around my body. One woman, I don't know her name, got a flesh wound in the arm. Several other strikers were pretty badly hurt. Then when the shooting stopped, the strikers started running away. In a minute or so, all the strikers had disappeared and only some of the workers were left. They walked around while we picked up the dead and some of the wounded. To show you how fast things happened, when the shooting stopped, I still had hold of the man I was holding when the thing started. It wasn't more than a minute or so, I guess. The sheriff said that the inquest would be conducted Monday afternoon. That in the meantime, the situation was quiet. There's an eyewitness thing here. This is from the guy that first got hit. Now I can't see that. There. Can you move the screen around a little? Can you move it back and forth? Whatever you were doing down there. Oh, okay.
Where's the union side of it? Here it says Union men didn't have a chance. They were shot down like dog. And they fled from the armed mob, which attacked them with just, without just cause. <coughs> the Unionists went to the mill on a peaceful mission, and unarmed, they were met with a burst of gunfire, which killed six and wounded scores. and them arming them after they got inside. Okay, you know what, Mikey, come, come over here. Okay. Okay. One second. <laughs> okay. Energy. Are you ready, Dan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you. Okay? Yep. Okay. Look at this. Here it says that uh, the people snuck in the mill starting at 545. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, it says there wasn't a firearm with the Union, and the first gun that they saw was a shotgun that a man named Johnson, who was a non-Union worker, had. And they, uh, the Unionists took it away from him when he pointed it at a squad of men. The weapon was loaded upon examination with three or four shells, and there were some in his pocket. Men inside the mill threw picker sticks down on non-unionists who were being kept from entering the mill by the unionists. Okay. Go ahead. All of a sudden, the armed men in front of the mill started shooting. Union men were shot down as they fled. They were retreating when the firing started. Lee Crawford was shot a second time as he lay wounded on the ground. I'm, I am told he did not, I did not see this, however. Women and children were not spared by the bullets. Bobby Balcom, eight, was wounded in the fleshy part of his lower leg. Mrs. Balcom was shot in the shoulder and Mrs. Lois McLean in the elbow. The Honeypath police took part in the shooting. I saw Chief George Page and Patrolman Charlie Smith and ETK standing in front of the mill with guns men stationed on the second story of the mill who took part in the firing. It's a wonder to me that more folks weren't killed and, and wounding than, than there was. I suppose most of the shooters were so excited they didn't take careful aim. I came to Anderson to tell you just that just to clear up some misunderstandings. We union men did not go to the mill this morning looking for trouble. We were not armed. If the non-union workers had just gone off and not tried to enter the mill as we asked them to, there would be six less dead men in Honey Path tonight. That's what really upsets me that people that didn't work in there or anything got killed. It's useless. Senseless. When you go shooting children in the street, it's, it's ridiculous. Go this way with it. This way. Go backwards anyway. Okay. Can we make it bigger? Um, so I can get all that in there. Okay. Okay, now what do you want me to do? Um, I want you to go to the left. 
you know, let it pass by slowly when you see something, you know, like a headline. Mm -hmm. can, oh, let's start again from the top. Industry labor dig in for textile strike, September 3rd. predict more shutdowns. Anderson Textile Mills in operation in face of strike. This is National Guardsman in front of a mill. Can you read strikers in South Carolina? Okay. Is it ready? Yep. Strikers in South Carolina pushing efforts to close plants. Determined drive being launched to close mills resuming operations yesterday. Labor leaders claiming many joining them in Greenville. Ready? September 5th, 1934. Strikers making drives on textile mills now running. More troops called in the state with tension increasing. Strike gaining in force, Sloan is not alarmed. Union labor leaders are claiming 85% will walk out. It's a baseball team. <laughs> they, had, they had a baseball team. That was sports section. It's okay. I'll go back to Went back to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so can, you, can you talk about that just a bit? Let's make sure that was, let's see. Yeah, it's the Anderson County Textile League. And Gluck was a mill. 110 to 9. Does it say the date in there? Um, September 6, 1934. Okay, so why don't you say the, say the date and mention that they're playing baseball in the middle of the strike? 
um, Thursday morning, September 6, 1934, Gluck, which was a male, beat Chicola 10 to 9 in a, in a baseball game in the championship. Weird. Could you it, say that they have a baseball game while the strike is going on? It's it's strange that they could even think about playing ball with all this stuff going on. They're probably non-union people. <laughs> I've always found that usually people that play on the company teams are company people. He probably figured the company was going to do something extra special for him for playing ball. Mm -hmm. 